Hello and welcome to Working Wise, a podcast created and produced by KNL Gates. Each episode is designed to provide labor and employment updates and compliance tips to lawyers and HR professionals. We hope you enjoy this podcast. Hi, my name is Penny Chen Fox, and I'm an attorney in KNL Gates' Los Angeles office. Hi, everyone. My name is Jin Cho, and I'm an attorney in the Chicago office of KNL Gates. Hello, my name is Jessica Kong, and I'm an attorney in the Seattle office of KML Gates. We're all attorneys um, in the firm's labor, employment, and workplace safety practice. Welcome to this episode of Working Wise, where we will be discussing various Silence No More acts um, in California, Illinois, and Washington State. So as uh, many might already know, as a result of the nationwide Me Too movement, several states enacted protective legislation that was aimed at curbing non-disclosure and confidentiality agreements in connection with sexual harassment claims. So we'll start with California since it's arguably the most comprehensive. So California's Silence No More Act really was enacted in January 2019. At the time, it was called the Stand Together Against Non-Disclosures Act, or STAND for short, which is very clever. And the STAND Act, in its most basic form, it prohibited employers from requiring a confidentiality or non-disparagement clause as part of the settlement of an employee's civil or administrative claim for sexual harassment, discrimination, or assault, or failure to prevent harassment or discrimination or retaliation. The idea, of course, was to prevent employers from buying the silence of sex harassment and discrimination victims and to encourage victims to share their stories and warn other potential victims. Well, fast forward two years, and within those two years, various states also enacted similar laws. Um, But not to be outdone, California revisited the Stand Act in late 2021 and uh, implemented some amendments to the act effective January 1, 2022. Now called the Silence No More Act, or Senate Bill 331, what this act did was to expand the prohibitions and restrictions from the 2019 law. So what protections and prohibitions existed in 2019 are now expanded to other types of victims. Now recall that the original law from 2019 was intended to protect victims of sexual harassment and discrimination. Now in 2022, that protection has been expanded to any type of workplace discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. So in addition to settlement agreements, uh, protections also extend to separation agreements as well. What's the difference or significance, you might ask? So typically, we see settlement agreements that are entered into to resolve claims after those claims have already been raised. For example, someone files a lawsuit and the parties reach a settlement agreement. Separation agreements, on the other hand, are negotiated upon the termination of an employee's employment relationship. Uh, There may or may not be specific claims alleged, and it's usually intended to be a very broad agreement. The expansion of the scope of Silence No More to separation agreements now affects agreements entered into even when there may not have been a specific claim alleged. So with that overview, let's go into what exactly Silence No More actually prohibits. In California, there's two main points that I like to raise. The first, of course, is that employers cannot include a provision in a settlement agreement that precludes employees from disclosing facts relating to workplace harassment or discrimination on any protected basis, no longer just sex harassment or discrimination. So what this means is that if you enter into a settlement agreement, you can no longer have a confidentiality agreement that precludes any sort of factual information regarding uh, harassment or discrimination. Categories beyond sexual harassment or discrimination include all other protected categories under the Fair Employment and Housing Act. So Silence No More now covers claims for discriminations or harassment based on race, color, religion, gender expression, age, sexual orientation, and various other categories that are covered under FIHA. Now, there is a carve-out for this prohibition. And that puts the ball in the claimant's court. So a claimant may still request a provision that protects his or her identity and any fact that could reveal his or her identity, so long as a government agency or public official is not a party to the agreement. What this means is that an employee can enter into an agreement that sort of carves out a silence no more prohibition as long as the 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 government and a government agency is not involved. This typically 
can be seen in perhaps a labor commissioner claim where the labor commissioner's office is involved in the settlement. So I understand that something similar like this also exists in Illinois. Maybe, Jen, you can give us a little more information on that. Thanks, Penny. In response to the hashtag MeToo movement, the Illinois legislature passed the Workplace Transparency Act, or WTA, to highlight and maintain transparency of sexual harassment claims. The act states that no contract, agreement, clause, covenant, waiver, or other document shall restrict an employee, prospective or former, from reporting allegations of unlawful conduct to federal, state, or local officials for investigation, including alleged criminal conduct or unlawful employment practices. So what does unlawful employment practices mean? Unlawful employment practices is defined under WTA as any form of unlawful discrimination, harassment, or retaliation that is actionable under the Illinois Human Rights Act. This is important because without this definition, one can arguably claim that unlawful employment practices encompasses wage and hour claims. And based on this definition, we know that that is simply not the case. So what kind of contracts are encompassed under the WTA? Well, let's talk about the first type, which is unilateral terms of employment. What does that mean? Section 125A states any agreement that is a unilateral condition of employment or continued employment that has a purpose of preventing an employee or prospective employee from making truthful statements or disclosures about unlawful employment practices is void and severable from an otherwise valid and enforceable contract under WTA. A simple example here is when an employer sets the terms and conditions for the employee, most likely in an offer letter, and there is no negotiation with the employee. That is a classic example of a unilateral terms of employment. Under the Act, Unilateral terms of employment may not bar truthful statements about unlawful employment practices or require arbitration or a waiver of other rights related to an existing or future claim. The second kind of contract that the WTA covers is mutual terms of employment. What does that mean? Well, a classic example would be when the employee and the employer had the opportunity to negotiate the terms and conditions of the employment relationship. Now, mutual terms of employment under the WTA may include provisions that are otherwise invalid under the Act if certain conditions are met. What are those conditions? Well, it needs to be in writing. It must demonstrate actual knowing and bargain for consideration from both parties and acknowledges the following rights the employee has. One, report any good faith allegation of unlawful employment practices to any respective government agency enforcing discrimination laws. Two, report any good faith allegation of criminal conduct to any appropriate government official. Three, participate in a proceeding with any respective government agency enforcing discrimination laws. Four, make any truthful statements or disclosures required by law. And five, request or receive confidential legal advice. Now, the last type of contract that is discussed under the WTA are settlement or termination agreements. Settlement agreements may also contain provisions that are otherwise invalid under WTA if certain conditions are likewise met. The Act itself, specifically under Section 1-30, states that the employer and the employee may enter into a valid and enforceable settlement or termination agreement that includes promises of confidentiality related to alleged unlawful employment practices. So long as, one, the confidentiality clause is documented as mutually beneficial to both parties. Two, the employer notifies the employee in writing of the right to have an attorney review before executing the agreement. Three, there is a valid bargain for consideration in exchange for the confidentiality. Four, the settlement or termination agreement does not waive any claims of unlawful employment practices that accrue after the date of execution of the agreement. And five, the settlement or termination agreement provides a 21 seven day period of revocation, which we will discuss in a little bit here in the episode. It's important to note that 
the employer may not unilaterally include any clause in a settlement or termination agreement that prohibits the employee from making truthful statements or disclosures regarding unlawful employment practices. Jess, what about Washington? Washington State has also enacted the Silence No More Act, which became effective June 9, 2022. The Silence No More Act repealed and replaced RCW 4944210, which was enacted in 2018, also as a result of the Me Too movement. RCW 4944210 prohibited non disclosure agreements that prevented disclosure of sexual assault and sexual harassment claims only and had an exception for settlement agreements. That has been repealed and replaced by another more, much broader. Um, Silence No More Act, which restricts any provision in any agreement without restriction between an employer and employee that would prohibit an employee from discussing or disclosing conduct or the existence of a settlement involving conduct that the employee reasonably believed under Washington state, federal, or common law to be illegal discrimination, illegal harassment, illegal retaliation, a wage and hour violation or sexual assault, or that's recognized as against a clear mandate of public policy. Um, that last phrase is arguably much broader than California's unlawful acts. It suggests that the act conduct itself doesn't have to necessarily be illegal, just against a clear mandate of public policy, which is not defined. Um, it's important to note that the term employee is defined to include prospective employees as well as independent contractors, which also increases the breadth of this law. It restricts an employer from firing, discriminating, or retaliating against an employee for discussing or disclosing conduct that the employee reasonably believed to be illegal harassment, illegal discrimination, or illegal retaliation, wage and hour violations, or sexual assault or that's recognized as illegal under state, federal, or common law, or that is recognized as against the clear mandate of public policy that occurs in the workplace or at a work-related event, whether or not that work-related event is on or off the employment premises and organized by the employer, between employees, or between the employer and an employee. It's also a violation of the section to even request that an employee enter into agreement that contains a provision that's prohibited by the Silence No More Act, and it contains a retroactivity clause that states it's a violation to attempt to even enforce a provision prohibited by this section or attempt to, in, to use influence to require the employee to comply with the provision that's prohibited by this section. The Act provides that this is meant to be retroactive, and the only exception is enforcement of non-disclosure, non-disparagement provisions that are contained in an agreement to settle a legal claim. Thank you for that, uh, for that overview, ladies. Uh, so I think this is a good time to get into a little bit more of the nitty-gritty. So I'll start with California, since uh, once again, California is not to be outdone. Uh, California imposes two additional specific requirements as part of SB 331 or Silence No More. First, employers cannot require an employee to sign a non-disparagement clause that precludes the disclosure of information about unlawful acts in the workplace in exchange for a raise or bonus or as a condition of employment or continued employment. That was a lot of legalese, so let's try to break it down a little bit. What this generally means is that when you have an employment agreement that involves a, that it's a condition of employment or a raise or a bonus, an employer cannot require an employee to sign an agreement that says that the employee cannot disparage the employer to the extent that that clause would prevent the disclosure of information regarding unlawful acts in the workplace. Now, unlawful acts in the workplace, this term is not quite defined. Um, you might find this term a little bit familiar, and that's because it's, it harkens back a little bit to Illinois' uh, in Unlawful Employment Act that Jen referenced earlier. So under the statute, unlawful acts in the workplace includes 
includes harassment or discrimination, or here's the key part, any other conduct the employee has reasonable cause to believe is unlawful. So that, of course, is extremely broad, um, and we expect the details of that definition and the scope to be cleared up in uh, subsequent case law. And as a second point that's worth noting, now separation agreements in California under Silence No More must provide uh, must meet two conditions. One, the agreement must give the employee notice about their right to consult an attorney. And two, the employee must be given reasonable time to consult with an attorney. Reasonable time here being five business days at a minimum. Of course, the employee can voluntarily um, accept an agreement before the expiration of the five-day period, uh, so long it's knowing, so long as it's knowing voluntary and without coercion. I understand that in Illinois there there is a similar provision. Maybe Jen, you could tell us a little more about that. Yes, Penny. Illinois legislature here got a little bit lazy and mirrored the language from the Older Worker Benefit Protection Act uh, notice obligation. So for those who are not familiar with uh, the OWPPA notice, employees that are over 40 years old have a right to an attorney review for a settlement agreement or termination agreements within a 21-day period, followed by seven days to revoke any sort of execution of said agreement here. That's what we call the 21-7 notice uh, requirement. Illinois literally adopted that probably word for word if if i have to sit down and, and sort of put my pen to paper but uh the distinction here is that illinois does not have any sort of age requirement so regardless if the employee is over or under 40 years old employers must provide 21 seven day revocation period for settlement and separation agreements. And this is to maintain the confidentiality clause. It needs to be mutually beneficial under the WTA here. On top of that, the WTA also amended a few things to the Illinois Human Rights Act, the IHRA. The main requirement that I understand California has already done is that Illinois employers must conduct annual training of sexual harassment. The Illinois Department of Human Rights, IDHR, created a model training that employers can use. Now, the department took some time to create said model training about nine months after this law went into effect. But nevertheless, they did come up with something and that something is posted on their website. And there are specific requirements that Illinois employers must check off in their sexual harassment training. And the department has the model training available for public use here. In addition to annual training of sexual harassment, Illinois employers are required to disclose certain information every year to the department effective July 1st of 2020. Employers that have an adverse judgment or administrative ruling against it in the prior calendar year shall disclose to the Department of Human Rights information totaling, for example, the number of the adverse judgments or administrative rulings during that year, any sort of equitable relief, and number of adverse judgments or administrative rulings for cases such as sexual harassment and discrimination uh, cases as well under the protected categories of the IHRA. Now you might ask yourself, what is an adverse judgment or an administrative ruling? We interpret it to mean that adverse judgments and administrative rulings are any final and non-appealable judgments issued in the employee's favor and against the employer. So typically an example would be any sort of rulings or orders issued by state circuit courts and federal courts. Those would need to be disclosed to the department. Anything not uh, non-appealable or final does not need to be disclosed to the department. Jess, does Washington have similar requirements? Washington does not have, doesn't specifically have consideration of revocation period that's attached to the Silent No More Act. Um, like California, Washington already had 
some statutes in place that address sexual harassment training. Washington State requires employers in certain industries to provide sexual harassment training, including hotels, motels, retail corporations, security guard entities, and property service contractors. All state employees are also mandated to take sexual harassment training. And the Washington State Human Rights Commission encourages all employers and employees to take sexual harassment training. California also, separate from the Silence No More Act, requires supervisors to engage in at least two hours of interactive sexual harassment training every two years. And that law was also expanded to require at least one hour of sexual harassment training for non-supervisory employees as well. Washington's quirks are that the restriction applies to any agreement. There's really no restrictions or definitions as to what that means. It also clarifies that you can restrict the disclosure of the amount paid, but not the terms of the settlement. There is clarification in the law itself that says the law is not meant to prohibit an employer and employee from entering into agreement to protect trade secrets, proprietary information, or confidential information that does not involve a legal act. And it also provides for a statutory monetary penalty in the amount of $10,000 or actual damages for a violation of the Silence No More Act, whichever is greater. And then the last thing that Washington adds, I'm not sure California and Illinois have, is that um, it specifically provides that any non-disclosure or non-disparagement clause that's signed by an employee that's a resident of Washington will be governed by Washington law. Thank you for that, Jess. So we've spent the last 20 or so minutes telling you what is not allowed. So let's let's summarize a few things that you still can do, you as an employer can do, even in the states that have enacted Silence No More similar legislation. So one, as mentioned by Jess earlier, the amount of a settlement can still remain confidential. Uh, this carve-out was expressed in California and Washington statutes and is not specifically addressed in Illinois. So to that extent, it can be seen as not having disturbed existing law on that part. And also confidentiality clauses uh, that are intended to protect trade secrets and proprietary information are still allowed. Again, this was expressly carved out for California and Washington, and I believe silent in Illinois. But here's where something is a little bit different. In California, arguably, the expanded protections under Silence No More affect only agreements that were entered into after January 1, 2022. So an agreement entered into prior to 2022 would be subject to only the narrow protection of the 2019 version of the law. Um, and as for pre-2019 agreements, most likely those agreements would not be affected by either version of the law. And California contains another express carve-out for Silence No More, and that's for negotiated settlements. Uh, so negotiated settlements are those agreements to resolve an employment discrimination claim that was filed either in court or before an agency uh, or in arbitration, perhaps, and also the employer's internal complaint process. Um, so long as the employee was given notice and an opportunity to retain counsel or was actually retained by counsel. So a negotiated settlement for a claim that was actually filed and the employee was given notice and an opportunity to retain counsel. And negotiated settlement specifically means a voluntary, deliberate, and informed agreement that provides consideration of value. Uh, that means that there needs to be some benefit that is offered along with the negotiated settlement. So overall, I think we just generally suggest that employers take a look at all of their employment agreements or agreements that employees might sign to see if there is a non-disparagement or confidentiality provision that might be affected by the Silence No More Act of the state that we've been discussing or another state that has enacted something similar and speak to counsel about whether or not those agreements need to be amended and how best to do that in a way that protect the company um, and be in compliance with these various provisions. And with that, thank you very much. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for listening to Working Wise. New episodes are available for download through iTunes, Google Play, and other podcast applications. If you have any topics you would like to hear about on the next Working Wise podcast, please send them to workingwise at klgates.com.